Welcome to the Undisputed Podcast. I'm your host, Jenny Taft. This podcast is the full show from today's episode of Undisputed from start to finish. We've got a busy slate, so skip Shannon. Let's get to it. Good morning. Welcome to Undisputed. I'm Jenny Taft with Skip Bayless and Shannon Sharp. How are you guys doing today? I'm doing great, Jenny. I got a great night's sleep. Ready to be, Skip. This is real, though, Skip. You're not virtual. You can't run away from me. This is real TV. <laughs> you know, we're about to talk about a tweet in which LeBron James oh, used okay. 10 fire emojis, and my response is about to deserve 20 fire emojis, <laughs> Mr. Sharp. And when he did that, I had I tweeted this. You can't see it, but Jenny knows what it is. <laughs> that is where we start today. There is so much to break down from Michael Jordan's documentary, and that is where I would like to begin today. In the fourth episode of The Last Dance, we saw Michael Jordan finally break through and win his first championship. LeBron, like many of us, was also watching and was moved by the emotions he saw from MJ. LeBron tweeted that seeing Jordan holding his first trophy had him tearing up. So Shannon, do you like what LeBron tweeted? I love it because it's relatable to LeBron. Um, LeBron, for the longest skip, you <clears throat> you remember before Michael finally broke through and won the title, he had won MVP. He was Defensive Player of the Year. He was dunk uh, champion. He was an MVP and considered by many to be the best player in the NBA, although he hadn't won a title. And they're like, yeah, he's great, but uh, yeah, he's unbelievable. We, he's rarefied, but... And so tr- finally breaking through, getting pad to, past the bad boy Pistons, finally winning that title in 91, it was like, okay, now I have the validation. M- Magic and Bird can't say, yeah, I've got MVPs. Uh, <clears throat> Jordan has MVPs like myself and uh, Magic, but where's the titles? Where's the finals MVP? Now he has that. LeBron might have had a little tougher road than <clears throat> uh, Jordan, excuse me, guys. Because, Skip, coming straight from college, I mean, coming straight from the uh, high school, going straight to the NBA, there were even greater expectations because they're like, this is a phenomenon. This is a once-in-a-lifetime player. We've never seen anything like him. And we saw this kid from a 17-year-old on the cover of Sports Illustrated going straight to the NBA, going to his hometown team, the Cleveland Cavaliers. So the expectations were normal. The failure after failure, being thought of as the best player, but not winning the title. And when you finally win that title, the, 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 the emotions start flooding out of you because you're like, Whew. Skip, you remember he got on stage after and they asked him what he, what he felt. And he said, it's about damn time. Basically, that's what Michael felt when he had that trophy in his hands and he's looking at it. Now I know the joy and the adulation that Magic felt, that Larry felt, and so many greats before me felt like to finally get over that hump. You know, Skip, when I go back to the Hall of Fame, there are, you know, probably 100 of us, 150 maybe come back every single year. But the guy that's most relatable to me that's around my age is Johnny Randall. Because Johnny Randall grew up in a very similar situation. No indoor plumbing, having to take tape or tub baths, uh, sleeping with, he slept with two other brothers in a bed, I slept with my grandmother. So he and I stories can relate. It's not a coincidence that he and I both, he was an undrafted free agent. I was a seventh round draft pick. We came out in the same year, went to the same place, Canton, Ohio. So the situation when we talk, I understand what he's talking about. He understands what I'm talking about. In this situation here, Skip, LeBron can clearly understand the emotions that Mike felt after winning that first title. I have no problem whatsoever because normally the man that's walked a mile in shoes knows what another man that's walking a similar mile feels like. (sighs) I hope you're finished, at least for a while, because (laughs) I'm about to (laughs) unleash on this tweet from LeBron James. The nerve of LeBron James, and I should have known this was coming, he somehow had to make the Last Dance documentary about him, and it's not about him. He somehow had to try to insinuate himself into the emotions that Michael Jordan was feeling 
when he held his first finals trophy. And it's not even remotely close. The 10 fire emojis that indicate what LeBron had to battle through to get to his first trophy had absolutely nothing to do with what Michael Jeffrey Jordan had to battle through to get to his first trophy. He had to battle through Larry Bird's Celtics and the original bad boy Pistons who had to invent a set of rules to stop him that became the title of Sam Smith's book about Jordan's first run to his first title, The Jordan Rules. And that finals, Michael had to get through Magic Johnson's Lakers to get to the point that we look back at the documentary and Larry Bird, after those two games at Boston Garden, said it's God disguised as Michael Jordan. Nobody ever said that through LeBron's struggles, that it's God disguised as LeBron James. Nobody said that. And Sunday night, we got to hear John Sally say, the great John Sally of the bad boy Pistons say about LeBron that the Jordan rules were designed to stop him because he isn't human. He isn't human, and I'm so happy that generations of kids are getting to see these highlights and getting to see behind the scenes of just how great the greatest player ever to play any sport truly was on camera and off camera. And the point is, how dare LeBron compare his struggles to Michael's when you look back at LeBron's struggles they're just pockmarked with epic fails. That first finals, LeBron had been in the league for four years, and he comes up against a team that you have told me from the start is broccoli. It's boring. It's overrated. That Tony Parker and especially Manu Ginobili are overrated, says the Hall of Famer Shannon Sharp. So it was Tim Duncan versus LeBron James. And LeBron was pretty miserable in those four games because they got swept, the Cleveland Cavaliers. And LeBron averaged, that was his first finals, 22-7-7. and seven. But from the field, he shot 36% in those four games. LeBron has been a 50% field goal shooter from the field on two-point shots and three-point shots. 50% he's made. He shot 30 36% in his first finals. And he shot 20% from three in his first finals. And then he segued right into that series against the Orlando Magic when he was proclaimed for hitting the greatest shot in the history of the world, the shot heard round the world against Orlando in game two to save the day, save the series, 1-1 going to Orlando. And what happened instead of meeting Kobe in the finals, as we all hoped would happen, that we all expected would happen. He lost to the Orlando Magic in six games. And in the closeout game, game six, to try to get back to a game seven in his house back in Cleveland, LeBron was pretty lousy. He was a minus 12. He shot eight for 20 from the field, which segued right into the next year, the Celtics series, his last go round the first time in Cleveland. They went 61 and 21 in the regular season. That's pretty great. And yet, in games four, five, and six against the Celtics, LeBron had his first epic fail in which he shrank, he disappeared in ways Michael Jordan never dreamed or nightmared of doing in a big playoff series. LeBron James was accused of quitting by his owner, and he, he was according to a member of his inner circle, that he had to be sedated before games four, five, and six because he was having an issue with his teammate. No, it was just an epic failure. The first time we saw the chosen one become the frozen one, and right away the next year in his second finals, right on schedule, it happened again in games four, five, and six. LeBron just disappeared. He froze up. 
Michael never froze up. Nobody ever said, gee, Michael quit in that series or, or Michael disappeared. He never disappeared. He was trying to fight through Larry Bird and the bad boys and Magic Johnson to get to that moment when he's hugging the trophy. And, and I'm sorry, you, you can't do that, LeBron. You can't say it's unexplainable what I was feeling. No, it's totally explainable. You, you failed and failed and failed, and it was your fault. And you didn't have the kind of competition that Michael Jordan had to fight through. So what are you doing? Once again, you're going egomaniacal, delusional. You're trying to say, hey, everybody, remember me? I'm LeBron James, and I belong in the same sentence or the same tweet with Michael Jordan. No, you don't. Why don't you just give it a rest, LeBron, and back off and let him have his moment because he earned his moments. He deserved yeah, these well, he moments was, that you're getting to watch. Well, first of all, Skip Bayless, if you look at the emojis mean, you know what it feels like when you've been through the fire. Skip, you just validated everything LeBron said. From the loss to the Spurs when he played bad to when he couldn't get past the Magic, losing to the Cavaliers, and it was reported, you've been reported, and others have said he had to be sedated, uh, being accused of quitting, losing his first finals in Miami, those are struggles. What you're trying to do, or you're trying to parse. Skip, you're trying to say, well, if you get hit by a Mack truck and someone else get hit by a, bump, a dump truck going 50 miles an hour, well, mine hurt worse. No, it does not. Struggles are struggles. You're trying to say it's all relative, Skip. Those were the power teams in the 80s that he had to get through, Skip. It does not matter what they call you. I can assure you, when Tom Brady threw for 505, there were some people, some guys on the Philly side thinking, that's the greatest quarterback I've ever seen. But guess what? He caught that L. The very same thing that Michael Jordan was uh, a regular season MVP, he was slam dunk champ, uh, uh, defensive player of the year, caught an L in the second round. Struggles. Skip, struggle is a relative term. I can't say just because I grew up like I grew up and somebody else grew up a little different that my struggles are different. A struggle is a struggle. What you're trying to do is parse it and say, well, LeBron James, what you went through that was self-inflicted. What Michael went through was self-inflicted because he wouldn't pass the ball. Remember? Did you watch oh, this? stop it. The thing that he's... Oh, no, I no, no, ain't no stop it. I'm just getting started. Woke up great. Had two pots of coffee, uh, Jenny. You know what, Skip Bennett? They told me Voltaire drank 50 uh, cups of coffee a day. I don't know if that's true. I don't even drink coffee, but I'm saying I feel good, Skip Bayless, because I was hoping this subject would coat or would, would broach itself, and lo and behold, it lands in my lap on a silver platter. I need you to stop trying to parse what LeBron went through. Oh, LeBron, it was self-inflicted. So was Michael, because he wouldn't pass the ball. And the Jordan rules were simple, Skip Bayless. A right-handed player that's dominant, keep him from the right side, keep him to keep the ball in his left hand, and push him left. So we're always going to push him towards his less dominant hand because you know what? He's not the passer that LeBron is. You don't have to worry about it because, see, you push him left, what's he going to do? He's not appendectious like LeBron. He's not looking to pass the ball because that's not what his forte is. So that's what the Jordan Rouge was. Yes, it was also to hammer him. Kind of like what the New England Patriots did to the Buffalo Bills in 90 and also replicated that uh, in 2001. Punish the receivers. When they catch it, make them pay a price. Get physical with them out the line of scrimmage and knock the crap out of their quarterback. Skip, that's not rules. That's fundamentally, that's sound physical football. Well, that's what the Jordan rules was. Jordan was a right-handed player. He was right-handed dominant. So keep him off the right side of the court, push him left, push him to his less, do less dominant hand, and let's go from there. Skip, the struggles that LeBron, LeBron went through, you validated because you listed all the things that happened to him. And so all those things that happened to him, guess what ultimately happened, Skip? He got to hold the trophy. And so finally, after everything Skip Bayless has said and what the owner said that I quit and not being able to get past the Celtics and melting down in 2011 and not being able to get past the Magic and falling to the Spurs, all of that is a struggle, Skip. You have sometimes, Skip, the destination. There's a journey to get to that destination. And sometimes it's pitted with pitfalls. But when you go through that, you have a greater appreciation for what you accomplished. Skip, I have the utmost respect for athletes and guys that go through hardships 
and ultimately get an opportunity to play a protect, uh, uh, regardless of it's sports. It can be if you're a lawyer or a doctor, whatever you've overcome, the adversity, you have a great appreciation for someone that's done that. Shouldn't LeBron, after going through what he went through, kind of like Michael, have a great appreciation and say, guys, I know what that feels like. Skip, Tiger Woods reached out to Michael Jordan, the only guy in the world that could possibly know what he was about to go through. Why would he do that, Skip? Why? Only somebody that's going through it could possibly know what the other's feeling. LeBron went okay, through it. I will definitely so he give knew you what Michael Tiger was and Michael. Yeah, I, I get that. Quick point of order about ambidexterity. I once witnessed yes. Michael Jeffrey Jordan shooting free throws for money, and on the last one, he shot it left-handed with a towel wrapped around his eyes, blindfolded, left-handed, blindfolded. I witnessed this, and he swished it for all the money. And I'm not sure how much was on the table, but I'm sure it was in the thousands, and that was in 1998. Probably. <laughs> Dollar was was obviously that that was a lot of money in 1998. And I, I would suggest to you that shooting free throws for money, that Michael is probably a better free throw shooter left handed than LeBron is right handed. That's just me speaking of ambidexterity. Now, back to my point in the struggles that Michael went through, there was no shame. Not once did he say or anybody say, boy, he had a bad game. He had an off series. He quit. He shrank. He this or it. No, nobody ever said that. And yet LeBron's struggles were all shameful to me, that they were all epic fails. So you can't compare the two struggles at all. It's not about you and John Randall. No, it, it's LeBron trying to say, I, I know what that feels. No, you don't know what that feels like because yeah, yeah. Michael was yeah, yeah. fighting Larry Bird and the bad boys and Magic Johnson. LeBron, when you finally broke through, you got to play the finals with Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh against the baby Thunder. And they had three young players who were going to get very good, but they weren't very good yet. And Kevin Durant did not play well in that series. And uh, Russell Westbrook often disappeared in that series. And James Harden has yet to be found in that series, in the 2012 finals. And yet, we talked about it yesterday, LeBron did have a lot of help from his teammates because in the, the turnaround game two, after the Heat lost game one, Shane Battier made five threes in that game. And remember game four, the Mario Chalmers game? Mario Chalmers scored 12 in the fourth quarter, just took it over and held off the baby thunder. And then what happened in the closeout game five? Uh, Mike Miller made seven of eight three-point shots. We talked about John Paxson in game five of the 91 right. finals, yes. five games over yes. the Lakers. John Paxson didn't make a single three. He did make nine field goals and he made seven jump shots, but they were two-point jump shots. Yeah. They weren't three-point daggers like Mike Miller shot seven of those Whoa. in game five. Hold on, hold and by the skip. way, in LeBron's skip, first victory, let me finish. No, LeBron James shot in that series against the Baby Thunder. He was three of 16 from three. That is 19 percent. Uh, that's not very good. So while the Spurs were saying, dare him to shoot, get off him, just dare him to shoot. The Baby Thunder just sort of let him shoot and he couldn't shoot anyway. So the point is. This you should be bragging about. This you understand what Michael's going. No, you don't. Stop it. Can, can, can I can I back up and, and take the, the last thing you said about John Paxson? Now you told everybody yesterday that Doc John Paxson made two point shots because the three point shot was em wasn't emphasized. Okay, so now you're holding against LeBron that the three point shot is emphasized and he has guys that have three point range. I'm confused. I'm confused with, with, with the discrepancy here. And you keep telling me, see, this no. is lot, and you just made it burnt. No. You made it crystal no, clear, No, time out, Skip. time out. You said. No, they, they weren't guarding John Paxson. They weren't guarding him. He, w he was shooting free throws from the wing, basically. 15-foot jump shots unguarded, which is why you saw Phil say in the, the huddle in the first quarter, Michael, if three guys are on you, who's open? Uh, Paxson? 
Yeah, they're not guarding John Paxson. Wait, what, what, Let him shoot so what, what, 15 foot jump shot. What, 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 Skip? You talk about you, Mike had to. So, so why did Phil have to tell him that? Why did Phil got to tell you well, three it, guys it, on it you, you still trying to make plays? Why? Be, because yeah, he had destroyed the Lakers in games two, three, and four to the point they're triple teaming Michael Jordan because he's God disguised as Michael Jordan. And finally, and Phil still, says, still why are we beating it? our head against the wall? Just let Paxson shoot it. Ta-da. And he's still trying to force it, although there's a man wide open. He has three on him. You've seen LeBron. So was Mike Miller shooting contested threes? Or was he wide open off LeBron's driving kicks? Of course, Skip made us. But see, the problem that I have, and so many others of you, all you said, even though he got swept twice, lost him because uh, 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 it was the best uh, three out of best three out of five back then. He lost three one to a Milwaukee. Oh, he didn't play. It wasn't his fault. He lost every time since then. Every other player that's lost the game, no matter how well he's played, he lost. So we nullify his performance. That's what you did against LeBron. LeBron was 36, 13, and 9, but he called an L. LeBron's been 20, uh, average a triple double, but he called an L. All those teams, and you make it seem like those teams, uh, uh, Magic Johnson. He beat the 91, the broken down Lakers. That was not the 85 Lakers, Skip. That was not the 80 Lakers. It was not the 82, uh, 82 Lakers, was it, Skip? Or was it? I'm confused now. You it make it seem like the Warriors. Magic. It was Worthy. It was Perkins. That's a lot of firepower. That's, that's a credible yeah. team to get through to win your first championship. Magic Johnson, that's Thank all you. I Hold need on. to say. Thank you. And think about this. Hold on, Skip. Remember now, Magic Johnson had gone to the finals in 84. He had gone to the finals again in 85. He went in 87. He went in 88. He went in 89. Well, damn, Skip. Michael Jordan had gone where? On vacation. Are you going to equate that to the same? A man's first finals in Magic Johnson. That was Magic Johnson's ninth final in 12 years. How is that the same? I just need to know. Okay, so wait a second. So Michael had to get through Magic Johnson playing in his ninth finals, one of the greatest yes. top three all-time player. You can debate that. Some people think he's the greatest player. Yes. Ever. So you had to get through him while LeBron had to get through the baby thunder. Really? Uh, You're comparing no, that? No, 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 I, he, the, I, whoa, I whoa, whoa, skip, no. He got through the, skip, he got through the Celtics. You know what he had to go through. He had to get through KG. KG doing all that woofing, talking about how we broke it. Oh, and Paul Pierce, the truth, we made him out to be a liar. We made him out to be a liar. And after we did what we okay, did, well, guess what we did? We got Ray Allen. Okay, better team, Bird Celtics or KG Celtics? Help me out. You didn't beat them. We beat ours, so it doesn't matter. It was relative to the time. Because all I know, you're over against the big three Celtics. And if you God, if you God, if you God in sneakers, you got to be, oh, slow, Larry, unathletic bird, Kevin McHale, <laughs> you and the chief, Robert Parrish, you got to beat them. If you God in sneakers, if you are what they Damn, say you are, shameful. you got to do what they said you can't. No, it is shameful. It is shameful that you won't give that man his rightful credit. Goat James needs his credit. Credit? And I'm giving it to him. For what? Yes. His flowers. I'm giving that man his flowers while he's alive. No mercy. So the Cowboys were able to land CeeDee Lamb in the draft, which many thought was a steal at number 17. The Eagles selected receiver Jalen Rager with their first round pick and then followed it up with Jalen Hurts in the second round. So Shannon, after the draft, who do you like better entering next season? Well, I think the Cowboys had the best draft. There's no question about that. I don't like really like a whole lot about the draft that the Eagles, but I still believe the Eagles are going to win the NFC East because the Cowboys will do Cowboy things. Nothing has changed. I need to see proof. I need to see proof that when they get on the field and they play a couple of games, and I'm not telling you, just like I said last year, they're going to get out to that roaring start because they're playing some cream puffs, and I hate to call some of the teams cream puffs, but that's what they were. But I told Skip Bayless, I said, when they get to the meat of that schedule, when the rubber needs to meet the roll, O'Shea Shaw gonna be sitting back like he on the beach. Just like this, like I'm in mean, old good old Cancun or Jamaica, the grill. That's why I like to go vacation at Jenny. And uh, look what happened. 
So this is all I'm saying, Skip. I like I like some of the offseason moves uh, that they've done. I like Darius Slay. I like that trade. I like Nicole Roby Coburn, slot corner. They got Jonathan Hargrave. Remember, Skip, they traded for Marquise Goodwin. So if D-Jack can come back, now they have speed to be able to lift the top out the coverage. Because D-Jack can run. Marquise Goodwin was an Olympian. He can run. Uh, Jalen Reger ran 4-4-2, if I'm not mistaken, at the combine. He can run. Uh, so I like what they've done. I really do. Uh, from that aspect, the offseason move, I don't really, the draft, I don't really see a whole other than Rager. Uh, I don't think um, this year Jalen Hurts is going to help him much. But you have to love what the Cowboys did. They got CeeDee Lamb in the 17th spot when no one thought he would be there. They got a DB in the second, got a corner, uh, Steph, uh, Trayvon Diggs. They got uh, Gallimore from uh, the, uh, OU. So, Skip, they loaded up. They got a lot of need. Now, I don't know if they got anybody per se to necessarily replace the production um, from uh, Robert Quinn left. Um, Byron Jones, I think they can find somebody to break up passes. <laughs> it wasn't like he was a takeaway machine, Skip. So if, if, if you can get two interceptions, you superseded what, what Byron Jones did last year. So with that being said, Skip, I believe that the Cowboys might even have the better team. But when it's all said and done, you guys will not be NFC East champs. You will be disappointed again. So would Jamie Foxx be crying, be imitating me on, on IG, talking about how I ran, rolled up on it. I did and going to do it again because guess what? The Cowboys going to mess it off again, and I'll be happy. You'll be sad saying, I don't know what happened. Hmm. So your only out is the Cowboys are going to do Cowboy things. So, gee, Dak has won the, the division <clears throat> twice, right? Is that and how many times things? have we won the division, made... Skip? How many, Skip? You won it twice. They both? Two and okay, two. Okay, so two and two. We, okay, this is this for the championship right here. This for the ch- title. Uh, question. Is old eight and eight yes. Jason Garrett still around? Is, is he still <laughs> coach clapping? Is he still over there clapping on the sideline, butt patting as they go by him after they turn the ball over? It's okay. It's okay. Is that guy nah, still y'all. there? I don't think so. No, he's not. Th- I think we got Mike <laughs> McCarthy, who was very successful as a Green Bay coach, who's a made man with a Super Bowl victory, who coached Brett Favre and, dare I say, even Joe Montana and Aaron Rodgers. Um, I'll take that as an upgrade over old 8-8 eight eight Jason. Oh, uh, yeah, what y'all do have, y'all got what they call massage Mike. You remember on Saturday, every Saturday, Skip, instead of being out there going through walkthroughs with the team like he's supposed to be, he getting a massage up in his office. So they dubbed him up in Green Bay, Massage Mike. Massage Mike McCarthy. Yep. Yeah, how about that? That's what you got. At least Jason Garrett was attentive. At least Jason Garrett was going through walkthroughs and not sending his lieutenants to do his job. How about that, Skip? Heck, if I know Jerry Jones, he probably liked the, the fact that he was massaged by That might have been why he hired him. Take your, you know, have, have your fun you when it's time to have your fun, because we know Jerry does. So here's the point. Yes. This offseason, on paper, my Dallas Cowboys have shot past the Eagles. I'm just doing it on paper, and I give you Darius Slay. He can play. That was a sweet pickup. And Roby Coleman's pretty good. We know he got away with something a couple of years ago in the NFC no, Championship game that will live in infamy. Yes, he did. But, <laughs> but he can play. So I give you those two. But you're missing the point. Look at all the defections and all the losses. Malcolm Jenkins, the leader of that secondary, is now a New Orleans Saint. Aguilar made a lot of big catches. I know he dropped a lot of balls, but he ain't there anymore. Jason Peters, for years, the best left tackle in pro football is gone. Big V, his backup, is gone. Vinny Curry, out. Timmy Jernigan, gone. Nigel Bradham, gone. Gruje Hill, gone. Man, that's a lot of losses from the defensive side also. And then I think we agree it's not like they dramatically upgraded in the draft while Dallas goes out and gets Ha-Ha Clinton Dix, Gerald McCoy, Dontari Poe, and Greg Zerline to, to shore up their place kicking, which cost them at least two games last year that would have made them a 10-6 and six football team and probably a playoff team. 
So if I show you just the free agent acquisitions, I'll take Dallas. And then we hit draft night on Thursday, Friday, and then obviously Saturday. And the Cowboys rocketed past the Eagles because Jerry Jones had his best draft ever. I thought Dallas had the best draft in pro football because their top six picks were all taken around later than they should have been. So it went all time steal in the first round CD. That's the steal the whole first round. And then it went steal, 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 steal. They stole all six of their top picks and they're all upgrades in the two cornerbacks that they they drafted. Trevon Diggs and Reggie Robinson are both big physical corners who can also play safety if, if you need them to transition to safety. But what do they have in common, Shannon? Ball hawks. Get hands on footballs. Receivers playing cornerback. Byron Jones was not that. What? All of a sudden, you've brought some spark, some new charisma, and, and some new energy to your secondary. And Neville Gallimore, I, I watched every snap he played at Oklahoma. All he does is just disrupt. He just leaps off your screen making plays. And you, you continue not to talk about Bradley and Nye taken later in the fifth round. All he was was the Pac-12 defensive end of the year. All Pac-12 two straight years. Had 24 sacks over his last two years. I have no idea how he was available. Mel Kuyper had him available. Thought he should have gone 90 picks earlier than he was taken. It's a steal. And he will help. And I believe Alden Smith will be reinstated. I believe Randy Gregory will be. And I think they're going to contribute along with Bradley and I, the cliff diver from Hawaii. He plays with edge, high motor. All of a sudden, you've brought high motor playmakers everywhere on defense. And you're adding CeeDee Lamb to Amari Cooper. Wait a second. And Gallup. And wait a second, number 21 still in the backfield the last time I checked, and the offensive line's still top whoa, whoa, whoa. five. It's explosive. Whoa, whoa. I, I, I'm looking on, at come firepower. No, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You tell me you just told everybody just two weeks ago, Zeke Elliott looks like he was still running in Cabo Fan. He's not that same guy. You only want Amari to play at home games. He, Jerry vastly overplayed because the guy tapped out against the Eagles. He tapped out against uh, 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 New England. He kept, I mean, he tapped uh, uh, the Jets. But now all of a sudden you heaping praise. Also, now it was me. I like Stephon Diggs. You said, when I watched Alabama, he didn't leap off the screen. Now, all of a sudden, he's with the Cowboys. He's jumping out the Jumbotron. What? What is this? First of all, another thing, I, Skip Bayless. No, I, I can walk. No, hold on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, look, Trevon Diggs. I, I just didn't like him against LSU because Jamar Chase was just picking on him. And, and it scares me. It haunts me, which is why I said publicly, I didn't say it on, on Undisputed. I tweeted this before the draft. I don't like Trevon Diggs at number 17 in the first round where a lot of people were mocking him to Dallas. And I was mocking that pick. That's no good. But if you can get Trevon Diggs, who might have gone to you at 17, if you can get him at 51, are you kidding me? That's a steal. Then, then it's worth it that he had one really bad game against LSU because a lot of people had bad games against Joe Burrow. I'm okay exactly. with that. It, he, he is still very, he's an athletic, I, I like his bloodlines to his big brother. He's a receiver playing cornerback. It's something we haven't had before. And, and I think he's got a little spark to him because of his brother. And Somebody else I'm talking to right now came into the league with a big brother who was a star <laughs> and didn't help a guy named Shannon Sharp turn into a Hall of Famer because he had a big brother named Sterling Sharp who was a great receiver. Yeah, Stephon Diggs is a, yeah, Skip, yeah, he's pretty good. I, Skip, I, I think the thing is that it's going to help. He can help Trayvon understand that what it's like to be a professional and how do you have to do your work. But he's going to have to make the plays. Let me tell you something about stealing. Skip, I can put, I can go to a local convenience store. I can put something in my pocket and walk round and round in that store. It's not a steal until I try to leave the premises. 
okay, you keep saying all these guys were steals. They only become steals if they can play. If they can't play, guess what they're called? Be bus. That's what they'll be called. Yep. So before you call them steals, let's see if they can play. Let's see if they stole them something, if Jerry stole them in the later rounds of the draft. Because like I said, I put something in my pocket, I can go aisle to aisle as long as I don't leave the premise. Okay, you say they stole them. Let's see when we put them on the field if they can play. If they can't play, uh, guess what? You thought you stole something and you got costume jewelry. That's what you got. Mm. Mm. Are you speaking of Jalen Rager by chance? The guy that the Eagles took in the first round? Could he be costume jewelry? Could he be zirconium? He might be. Whoa, hold on. We're talking about the Cowboys and how they stole all these players around the two lower than what many believe they should have gone. Okay, there have been some guys that go higher than what people think they should have gone. And how did that work out? Sometimes, Skip, look, it's kind of like horse racing. You breathe the best to the best and hope for the best. And all of them look out there. The muscles are short and you see all the veins. It's not until you get them to the track and they get next to the other 15, 16 thoroughbreds, whether or not you know what you got. So, yeah, all of them look good. They put the little cap on, cowboys, and Jerry's on his big yacht. I'm great. I've always wanted to be a cowboy. But it's not until you get into the game, until that fire, and you ask to make a play or you ask to prevent a play, then and only then will you know what you got, Skip Baylor. So everybody looks good right now. Trust me, in short, woo, boy, everybody time fast, everybody jumped high. But you know how football's played. I've seen a lot of guys that can run fast and jump high. Man, when they put them pads on, mm, look like Tarzan played like Jane. And all of a sudden, that cheetah turned into a snail. So we're about to find out, Skip Bayless. We're going to find out if what you say is true. By the way, quick point of order. One time in 1992, Jimmy Johnson (laughs) came to me. The first day after the rookies came in, not in pads, just in shorts, and he had taken a kid in the sixth round who will go nameless for the sake of this conversation. Jimmy walked over to me and said, so-and-so can't play. I said, you just drafted him. He said, I know, but I saw him out here to the, today and he can't play. Oh, and he was right. Mm-hmm. He couldn't play. Okay, so now I'm going to change the subject to the ultimate difference maker in this debate that we're having right now. And I'm going to be objective about this because it's still going to come down to Dak Prescott. Rain Dakota Prescott. We know he's going through some grieving because he lost his older brother. And God help him and his family. We're with him on that. We're thinking about him. Mm -hmm. But Shannon, back on the football field, when push comes to shove, it's time to ask Is this deal ever going to get done? And my point is, there's such new momentum off this draft, starting with CeeDee Lamb, that I'm hoping that once Dak gets through with the process, I mean, you never get through with grieving your older brother, but once once he gets back to the negotiating table, which will happen pretty soon, I'm hoping he will feel the new momentum. I'm hoping he'll say, gee, I've got CeeDee Lamb. He could be a new number one receiver, maybe even better than Amari. And I still got Gallup and I still got Zeke and I still got that line. And we have a better defense. And it's time to compromise a little bit. It's it's time to come to the middle of the table and try to get this Mm -hmm. deal finished for the sake of the football team. So, again, Mm -hmm. if Dak is a holdout through whatever camp we have, Obviously, he's going to miss the virtual sort of offseason that they're going to have. But if he's a holdout through camp, through whatever preseason games there are, heck, if he's a holdout for games one and two, which is still a distinct possibility, all bets are off. So now it's the ball is in rain Dakota Prescott's court, and I'm trusting his football character to help get this deal done. 
And, th and that's what owners try to do. They always try to pit it. Uh, make a compromise. It's always the player that's re uh, that's has to take the compromise. It's always the player pitted as being selfish. No, Jerry. No, no, no. You keep talking about we've made an offer and it's got to be right for us. And you said, oh, when it comes time to play football, he'll be here to play. You being very dismissive. If I'm Dak Prescott, I'm holding steady to my guns. They keep saying, oh, Dak, they are offering Dak to be the highest paid player in NFL history. How much money is fully guaranteed? Clarence Hill Jr., you keep tweeting they offered him $35 million. How much is fully guaranteed? Skip, did you see that? Taysom Hill, two years, $21 million, 16.5 fully guaranteed. That's what I need to know. Not how much the totality of the contract, because numbers mean nothing in football. How much is fully guaranteed? And I'm tired of you talking about the offensive line. See, now all of a sudden you talk about the Cowboys going to the NFC East. The same offensive line that you heaping praise on used to come in there every Sunday and talk about they got their golden tails kicked. Now you loving them. Zeke Elliott running in Cabo saying, now you loving him. Amari Cooper tapped out. Now you loving him. Oh, now you love everybody. Man, you need to stop, Skip. Hey, I still got Ty Smith. I still got Lyle Collins. I still oh. got Zach Martin. I, I still got... Connor McGovern at center, who I think it, he played center at Penn <laughs> okay. State. I think he'll be pretty good. I, I think there'll be a top five what? line. That's all I'm saying. That will be what? good enough. They were top five last year. Was Ty Smith there last year? All decade player. Zach Martin, all decade player. Were they there last year? And with eight and eight, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You should be. That's what you should be ashamed I'm of. of myself. All those all decade players. Yep. yep. All I'm right. I'm moving Jerry on Jones from the Cowboys. I'm moving. He did have a good draft skip, and that we cannot take away from you. No mercy. So after Tom Brady signed with the Bucks, Shannon bet Skip that Bill Belichick and the Patriots would win more games than Brady in Tampa this season. But since then, Rob Gronkowski came out of retirement, was traded to the Bucks, who also made several draft picks to support Brady. So, Shannon, after the draft, on a scale of 1 to 10, how confident are you in your prediction? I'm not as, <laughs> as confident as I originally, <laughs> I originally were. Uh, Skip, it, it doesn't look good. It does not look good. I mean, getting Gronk <laughs> to come out of retirement, getting Kristen Worth, the big tackle out of Iowa, they solidified. They, they got uh, Brady another weapon, and they got a protector that he needs to make sure Brady feels protected. I like the Anton, Win uh, Anton Winfield uh, Jr. Uh, pick in the second round at the safety position. Um, Coach Belichick really didn't do a whole lot in the draft. They, did, they didn't do anything in free agency, Skip. But it appears to me that Coach Belichick says, we're going to win games this year in 2020, just like we won last year. Skip, there were not very many games that we can look back on in 2019 and say, you know what? They won that game because Tom Brady's the quarterback. They played outstanding defense. Brady minimized his turnovers, and that's what happened. And so it looks to me, Coach Belichick says, look, I want to have a top one, top two defense again. Stead, don't turn the ball over, and we're going to win ball games like that. And he says if we won 12 games with Brady having a ho-hum season and, you know, by his standard, it was not Brady-esque. We should be able to win 10 games with Stead if he doesn't put us in harm's way. So I think they'll coach him hard, obviously. He's had a year to be in that system, Skip. But they've done nothing really to say, like, wow. I'm not sure with the expectation that's on Buffalo. The Jets, uh, yeah, they got some. They, they did okay in the draft. I'm not, I'm not turning cartwheels for them. The Dolphins has a little better, have a little more expectations. We'll see how Fitzpatrick and when, if they transition to Tua this year, how that turns out. But I believe the Patriots will be right in the thick of the AFC East. Whether or not they'll have a better record, Skip, I'm not nearly as confident as I was going into the draft as I am heading out of the draft. Wait, did I just hear Shannon Sharp concede this bet to me? I ain't concede that, I ain't concede that yet. Not yet, not yet. There's still a chance. There's uh, no. uh Andy Dalton is still available, and Cam is still available. Okay. So your confidence level, scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the highest, is what now? A 2? Nah, I'm more like 4-ish, 5-ish. 
four-ish or five well, I was like says Shannon Sharp. Yeah, whereas before I was like seven-ish, eight-ish. Aha. Uh-huh. <laughs> so my confidence level, scale of one to ten, on each of the records that I predicted, I said 12 <laughs> and four for Tampa. I'm now a 10 on that scale of confidence. <laughs> I also predicted okay. eight and eight for Belichick without Brady. And right now, my confidence in my eight and eight pick is a two because I don't see how they're going to go eight and eight. It's looking <laughs> six and ten ish, maybe seven and nine ish at best. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't see it. Unless he's got that one last ace up his sleeve, as you suggest, Cam, Andy Dalton, I, and I don't see how he can add them because all the reports out of New England are they don't have any cap space. Cam would have to play for virtually nothing to, to play next year for New England, and maybe he would be desperate enough to do that. But Andy Dalton is still scheduled to make whatever it is, 20-odd million dollars. They, million. they can't do that. They don't have, What's that? It's, it's, I think it's like $17.7 million, but he got a big cap hit. So, Skip, they might have to get, I mean, if he's willing yeah. to restructure it, maybe do a two-year deal and spread some of that money out. And remember, you're still going to have to trade for him, so you're going to have to give up some asset. I don't know what asset he has on his roster that Cincinnati would really want right now. Maybe next year's, you know, second round pick, yeah. third round pick. No, maybe. no, no, no. We give you four. We give you fourth or fifth. Oh, oh, okay, got it. So the point is that he has had a mass exodus in free agency, and I, I could go on all day. But remember, James Devlin, their Pro Bowl fullback, just retired. And then they lost Kyle Van Oy, Jamie Collins, Danny Shelton, Philip Dorsett, Ted Karras, who was their starting center last year, Elandon Roberts. They traded Deron Harmon. They cut uh, Goskowski. I'm like, Bill, what what are you doing? He, He added, obviously, Brian Hoyer came back for his third trip to New England. (laughs) <laughs> and Adrian Phillips is a good special teams player, and Demir Bird's not bad as sort of a backup receiver, and the immortal Bo Allen, a defensive tackle. That's all you did in free agency, and I'm saying, Bill, wake up. Do something. So I told you yesterday, I thought Bill would, would manipulate and finally just dominate the draft as, as he has the capability of doing, and I kept waiting, and nothing happened. Yeah. They did not take not, a quarterback. Not really they had shots. Yeah, but they, they had shots at Jordan but, Love, obviously. They had shots at, at Jalen Hurts. Nope, 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 nope. Go ahead. Yeah, when you really look at it, Coach, Coach Belichick has hit a couple of times, but none of his first rounders, uh, maybe McCordy, but if you look at it, his first rounders haven't been very good. I mean, he for every nope. one that he hits, he'll miss four or five. For every Richard Seymour, he, he just wastes that. So his his thing is getting other guys from other teams and making and turning them into something. That's what really what his his cup of tea is, Skip. But when you look at it, there's pressure that's going to be on Tampa Bay. Pressure that they have not felt in a very, very long time. Now we know Tom Brady has dealt with pressure for 20 plus years. We know Gronk has de- dealt with pressure. But can you say anybody else in that Tampa organization from player standpoint? has been able to deal with pressure, knows what it's like to be expected to win, knows what it's like to be expected to win the division, what it's like to get to the Super Bowl, to win, because that's what the expectations are, Skip Bayless. You know when you are these type of guys, a Brady, uh, a Manning, these elite guys, it's kind of like basketball, Skip. The expectation for LeBron is championship, getting to the finals. The expectation for these uh, Kevin Durant and Jordan and uh, Magic and Michael were finals. It's not about good regular season. It's not about stats. It's about getting to that ultimate destination. Nobody else other than the two guys that they got in the offseason knows what that's like. Bruce Arians knows what it's like to be a coordinator. Skip, we've seen a lot of coordinators win Super Bowl as coordinators and not have that success as a head coach because now you have the total package. You're not just worried about one group. You're worried about the whole entire ship. And so we're going to see if B.A. can handle that type of pressure and that type of expectation. Because, Skip, yes, he is a player's coach, but he will speak his mind, and he has somewhat of a temper. Did you see what 
Sean Payton said yesterday about watching The Last Dance and Michael Jordan, whom he knows very well. And he said, mm -hmm. Michael brought up everyone around him. And his quote was, I think that will happen with Tom in Tampa, that he will bring up everyone around him. That's why they're riding this, this wave of momentum and emotion in Tampa, because they got two goats. They got Brady and Gronk. They had a terrific first three picks of their draft, which will, will mm -hmm. help, help, help. And now you, you're adding all that to two Pro Bowl receivers and an offense that allowed Jameis Winston to throw for more than 5,000 yards and lead the league in passing yards. Obviously, he also led in turnovers by 12. That will get canceled mm -hmm. out by Tom Brady. So I don't know what's not to like about Tom Brady being the new leader, the new tone setter for that team. It won't matter what Bruce Arians does as long as Tom takes over and starts to recreate the New England culture in Tampa. And now let me finish back to my Belichick point. It, it appears okay. to me right now that Belichick is trying to send a message to the NFL. And that message is a dangerous one, but he's basically saying, I don't need Tom Brady. I don't need Rob Gronkowski. I don't need anybody you've ever heard of out there because I'm Bill Belichick. So if Mel Kuyper wants to give me a C plus on my draft, that's okay with me. I don't care what you think of my draft because it doesn't matter. I'll take whatever cogs I have and because I'm the GOAT coach, I'll show you I can win with people you've never heard of. Okay, good luck, Bill. You are on because he's saying he can win with the quarterback he calls Stid, as in Jared Stidham, yep. uh, a fourth round draft choice who I watched a lot at Baylor and a lot at Auburn. And he's athletic and he's got a nice arm, but he also tends to lose his poise under fire. He's going to have to step into the winged cleats of the GOAT, Tom Brady. And I don't wish that upon anybody, especially a fourth round draft choice with no experience. Maybe Brian Hoyer will start for a while next year. I don't know. But my gut is it will be stid or bust. And my gut is it will be bust because I think Belichick is going to get exposed without Tom Brady. Skip, you know who a, a lot of the pressure is on? is uh, Josh McDaniels. Because every year, Skip, he's a hot coaching commodity. Oh, this offense, oh, this offense. For the first time, people are gonna go see what Josh McDaniels, because we remember what Josh McDaniels was like without Tom Brady. He tried to be a head coach in Denver, it was an epic play, fail. He went to the Rams, Skip. Remember, he went to the Rams as an offensive coordinator, and it was horrible there. So now the pressure's on him. We're about to find out, Skip, how good of an offensive mind he is and how many more coaching opportunities he's going to have to be a head coach. Because we've seen guys, Skip, these great players, get coaches, be it an offensive line coach, a, a receiver's coach, or an OC, opportunity to be head coach. We saw it with Brett Favre, Steve Mariucci, John Gruden, uh, Big Red Andy Reid. Ray. So many guys got head coaching jobs that touched him. You look at Ray Lewis. Jack Del Rio became a head coach. Rex Ryan became a head coach. Mike Smith, Marvin Lewis, all those guys kept, became head Mike Nolan, all those guys. And we've seen that happen. Great players get, get, get a coordinator's opportunity to become a head coach. So now we're about to find out just how good of an offensive mind that Josh McDaniels is. Because there is no Brady. There is no bailout. Because sometimes, Skip, you can call a horrible play and a great player will make that the perfect play. So we're about to find out, Josh McDaniels, just how good you are. I agree. But ultimately, this is on the head of Bill Belichick. And I told you yesterday, mm -hmm. he's in danger already of getting fired as the GM of the Patriots. <laughs> I believe Robert Kraft is going to have to take that away from him. And that could lead to destruction on the other side because I don't know if Bill's going to stand <laughs> for that. So again, I think no. it's heading for disaster in New England because Tom Brady's in Tampa. 
you're not fired. You can't fire the general manager, Bill Belichick, without firing the head coach. And I don't see that happening anytime soon. Coach Belichick got another three to five years if he wants it. No mercy. So yesterday, the Cowboys released their rookie jersey numbers with the exception of CeeDee Lamb, who is yet to be announced. CeeDee was number two in college and after the draft said he wanted to wear number 10. Jerry Jones said a former college teammate who recently passed away wore 88 in college and Jones would like to see CeeDee wear that number. Bryant, Drew Pearson, and Michael Irvin also wore 88 for the Cowboys. So Shannon, in your opinion, are you okay with Jerry encouraging CD to wear 88? No. I get it, Jerry. I get it. You lost your best friend, but CD Lamb, his his dream, he wants to wear number 10. Let him wear the number. Don't impose what you would want on this young man. Allow him to be who he wants to be. Maybe he does, he understands who wore that number. Drew Pearson, uh, Jenny, you mentioned, Michael Irvin, Dez Bryant. He wants to carve out his own path. Skip, you know, uh, LSU has a tradition where, like, I think Pat Peterson wore number seven. Leonard Fournette wore, uh, uh, well, Honey Badger wore before Leonard Fournette wore the number seven. And I get it, some traditions, like number 60 in Texas, Skip, and I know you know the story in history about Tommy Nobis uh, wearing number 60, and they give that number 60 to certain linebackers, but you got to be worthy of that number. But they deem you worthy, and you got to be like, nah, sometimes guys would probably say, nah, I don't want that number. But if he wants to be 10, allow him to be 10. I get it, Jerry, and I'm sorry to hear that you lost a good friend of yours. But his number was 88. C.D. Lamb does, might, might not want to wear 88. So I don't think it would be, I, I, I would hope that Jerry doesn't pressure the kid to wear the number because that's what he wants him to wear. Allow him to wear it because he's done it this far, Skip. He's gotten to this point by doing things a certain, a certain way. And so allow him, if he wants to wear number 10, allow him to wear number 10 and don't try to steer him into wearing 88. Okay, so I agree with your premise, but let's go deeper into this. This is mm -hmm. another first from Jerry Jones. I have never ever heard of an owner trying to encourage any new star player, certainly a rookie, to wear a certain number. And the reason right. Jerry Jones is doing this is because his best friend on the 1964 Arkansas Razorbacks National Championship team was named Jerry Lamb. So it's Jerry as in Jerry Jones and Lamb as in C.D. Lamb. Jerry Lamb was a receiver who wore 88 and was a leader of that team that went 11 and 0 and beat Nebraska in the Cotton Bowl, then got voted the national champs. Obviously it was Jerry Jones at offensive guard and Jimmy Johnson, his roommate, just because it was alphabetical order on the road, Jones Johnson, <laughs> Jones his roommate Johnson. was the, was a defensive lineman, defensive end on that team. So, Jerry Lamb then went on to become not only a, a friend of Jerry Jones's, but a, a, one of his key advisors through his time of buying and owning and operating the Dallas Cowboys. Very close. So it struck Jerry Jones that Jerry Lamb just passed last January. Oh, well, right on time, we draft a guy who falls out of heaven into our laps named Lamb, well, then he should wear 88 in honor of Jerry Lamb, my friend and confidant and advisor. Uh, right. Jerry, 88 <laughs> is sacred. Jerry, it's hallowed. It was worn by a Drew Pearson that I've, I've campaigned for years to get Drew Pearson in the Hall of Fame. He deserves mm -hmm. so completely to be in the Hall of Fame he made most of the greatest catches in Cowboy history. Drew Pearson caught the Hail Mary from Roger Staubach that yeah. beat the Vikings, yeah. sorry, Jenny, in a playoff game. It was a little controversial, but it was the Hail Mary. Yep, you can argue, <laughs> but it was the Hail Mary. And then 88 was worn by a man I have argued is the greatest wide receiver ever and was the leader and the rocket fuel of three championship teams through the 90s that should have been five or six straight championship teams. And then all of a sudden it goes to a Des Bryant 
who who was sort of unopposed at receiver at that point when he was drafted late in the first round in the Tebow draft. And yet he mm-hmm. embraced 88, lived up, stood up to it. And from 2012 through 2014, Des Bryant, to me, was the best receiver in football and led all receivers through those three years in touchdown catches with 41. So he lived up to 88. Let's see. We go Drew Pearson, Michael Irvin, Des Bryant, CeeDee Lamb. So, Shannon, it reminds me of the line, I don't think you know Talladega Nights, but one of my favorite movies in which Michael (laughs) Clark Duncan says to Will Ferrell's character, Ricky Bobby, don't you put that evil on me, Ricky Bobby. Well, Jerry, (laughs) don't you put that evil on CeeDee Lamb because it's unfair. It's, It's a lot to ask of a kid who fell into your lap. You hadn't even really interviewed him. You had him number six on your board and he fell to you at 17. And now you're going to put that evil on him, so to speak, that number 88. It's a lot to live up to. It's a lot of early pressure and expectation that he probably doesn't deserve. Look, if he's as good as I think he is, he'll be just fine with it. But Shannon, to your point, he chose 10 because his idol is DeAndre Hopkins. He plays a lot like DeAndre plays. He does. I'm not saying he's going to even be DeAndre. I think he's got a chance, but that's who he wants to be. Okay, so why wouldn't you just give in? It's, It's not a big enough deal to him to honor your friend Jerry Lamb by wearing 88, but he already chose 10. Yeah, it, it's just Skip. Jerry. It's Jerry going off the rails again. Here is what's happening. <laughs> Skip the way I look at it, and I don't want to sound crass, but Jerry, you want to honor him. CD Lamb wants to honor DeAndre Hopkins by wearing the number ten. Yeah, you want to honor him. That's yeah. not CD. That's not CD Lamb saying, "Okay, Jerry, I want to honor that guy for you." No, that's not what he said. He says, "I want number 10. So why does, because you want to honor him, you bestow, okay, I want to honor him, so I want to see 88 on your back and see Lamb. So every time I see Lamb, I'm thinking about my old friend. Huh? No. That's, Skip, that's not how it works. Yeah, because people will fairly quickly forget, oh, oh, wait a second, Jerry asked him to wear this. A lot of people will right, lead to you. the conclusion Oh, he chose to wear 88 because he thinks he's Drew Pearson plus Michael Irvin plus Des Bryant. Right. I, right. I don't know. I hope Jerry backs off this one. Let this young man be who this young man wants to become, and he wants to become DeAndre Hopkins. I'm great with that. Can he live up to yes. being 88? Sure he can. But, Jerry, I know it seems like a heaven-sent coincidence, Jerry Lamb, C.D. Lamb, 88. <laughs> I, I got it. Right. Don't do it. Back off. Leave him be. Let him be who he wants to be. Skip, the only, one of the main reasons that I ended up going to Savannah State, I told my head coach, he came to recruit me, Bill Davis at the time, I said, I want the number two. He says, son, whoever has number two, because my brother was number two at the University of South Carolina. He says, whoever has that number, you can get it. Okay, I was 81. I was number one starting out in the NFL. I was 81 for two years. When Ricky Natiel, who was 84, who was a first-round draft pick, when he left, I went to Dan's office. I said, Dan, can I get 84? Because my brother's 84, and you know what he means to me. He's like, sure. Skip, I'd have been very disappointed had Dan said, well, you know what, Shannon? A good friend of mine used to wear 85. I kind of want you to wear 85. Would you do? Would you wear 85? Hell no! Nah. I said I want to be 84. I want to honor my brother. I understand that's a personal connection with you, but Skip, I don't have the same personal connection. Right. So remember, <clears throat> in the NFL, you you have to wear 10 to 19 as a wide receiver, or right. 80 to 89 80s. as a wide receiver. Correct. Uh, yeah, Correct. you can't wear number two. You, they won't allow a wide right. receiver. You know, obviously, CD was number two as you were in college, but he probably right. would love to wear number two in pro football, and they say, we don't yes. do that. Okay? All right. right? So number 10 was open because number 10 last year was Tavon Austin. He is no longer on the roster. I miss him. I still right. like him. But he is still a free agent. I don't know what's gonna, how that's going to play out. But he is not a cowboy anymore. 
10 is available right. without him having to, quote unquote, negotiate for number 10. It's there. Right. Let him have it. And you know, another thing you skip is that you kind of want to get a number and make your own identity out of that number. You don't want to go. I mean, I mean, I mean, try to think about trying to get a number that all these other greats have, have worn in 88. I mean, how do you distinguish yourself? I mean, so for me, it was about getting a number and making that number what it became. Mm -hmm. My brother was three in high school. I wore three. I was two in college where they retired the number two at my school and at my brother's school. I had 84 because he had 84. Yeah. I wanted to make a number that like, OK, 84 for the Broncos. So when you see 84 at the Broncos, they think, hey, hey, they think, hey, oh, me. 88. Oh, Michael Irvin wore that number. Drew Pearson wore that number. Dan Bryant wore that number. What's the speciality? What, what distinguishes me, Skip? Yep. <laughs> There's going to be enough pressure on CeeDee Lamb. Let the guy wear whatever number he wants to wear. I'm not worried. He'll be just fine, but let him do what he wants to do. No mercy. In the fourth episode of The Last Dance, we saw Michael Jordan finally break through and win his first championship. LeBron, like many of us, was also watching and was moved by the emotions he saw from MJ. LeBron tweeted that seeing Jordan holding his first trophy had him tearing up. So Skip, do you like what LeBron James had to tweet here? You know, Jenny, when I first read this tweet last night, I sat back and I thought, man, I, I bang on LeBron too much on Undisputed. I, I, should, I should let this go. I should let it pass. I should leave it be at least for one day. And then the more I thought about it, no, I'm not going to let this one go. It's so outrageous that it's shameful that LeBron James has the audacity to make the last dance about him. He just can't stand it. He can't just watch like the rest of us and be in awe like the rest of us and honor the greatest player who ever played in any sport like the rest of us. He's got to say between the lines, remember me, I'm LeBron James. And I know what Michael's going through with his first championship trophy in his hands because I can relate to that. Nope, you can't relate to that. The way it happened to Michael is not the way it happened to you. Your struggles had zero to do with Michael's struggles. In the end, when I look at what happened, his struggles were epic, LeBron, and yours were epic fails. His struggles were legendary, and yours, LeBron, were just shameful. They were infamous. So how can you relate to what he was going through when he had to get through or try to get through Larry Bird's two-time champion Boston Celtics and the dynastic bad boy Pistons, who were bad boys on the basketball court, and then through Magic Johnson's Lakers to get to a championship series in the finals that was his first finals. LeBron, when you won your first one, you'd already played in two finals and had epic fails in both. Mm -hmm. So Michael played mm -hmm. in his first one and won mm -hmm. it against Magic Johnson. You played in your first one with Dwayne, with Chris Bosh, against the baby Thunder. And yeah, you broke through and I stood on ESPN and gave you a standing ovation because, as you said, it was about damn time. But it was the baby thunder. And in that series, you shot 19 percent from three. So so that wasn't exactly legendary. And then if I can remind everybody in your first finals against my San Antonio Spurs that my partner Shannon Sharp says overrated. Tony Parker overrated. Manu Ginobili way overrated. Tim Duncan, great. So it was just basically LeBron versus Tim Duncan. And you tell me, Shannon, LeBron's the GOAT. And that was his fourth year in the league, so he was already doing goatish things. Uh, he averaged 22-7-7 seven and seven in that series. He shot 36% from the field, not from three, from the field did LeBron James. That's pretty pathetic. Then segue two more years to that Magic series. We're all on the edge of our seats waiting for LeBron versus Kobe in the finals. 
And LeBron hits the shot heard around the world in game two to save the series in Cleveland. One to one going back to Orlando. And that was the end of LeBron James as we knew and loved him that year. And by the way, he walked off the floor without shaking anybody's hand at the end of that series. But that's neither here nor there, as Shannon Sharp always says, which segues to his last series. Yeah, yeah, last series against Boston, that first go round in Cleveland, games four, five and six. LeBron disappeared to the point that his owner accused him of quitting. And somebody from his camp leaked that he had to be sedated because he was having an issue in the locker room with a teammate. Baloney. The chosen one became the frozen one as the pressure mounted toward another shot at getting back to the finals. That never happened to Michael Jeffrey Jordan. Not one time did anybody accuse him of quitting in his struggles or in having to be sedated or disappearing or any of the things LeBron did before he made it back to his second finals. And it was the all time meltdown against Dallas up two games to one and then games four, five and six. I couldn't find him. Nobody could find him. It was the worst superstar meltdown in the history of superstars. We've never seen anything like that. So, LeBron, you have the audacity you dare to equate your struggles and suffering to Michael's? He finally broke through against Magic's Lakers. It's not the same thing. And in his first finals, he won it. And then, obviously, he went on to win six straight with six MVPs. Don't insinuate yourself into this documentary, LeBron, saying you can relate because in the end, I'm sorry you can't. Well, I'm going to have to disagree with you. I believe Greg Norman melting down with a six shot lead at the 96 Masters, if I'm not mistaken, Nick Faldo chased him down. I think that might be the greatest, but that's neither here nor there. We're going to talk about this. But Skip, here's the thing. Now, I, when I look at struggles, you see, and what you're trying to do, you're trying to eat. You're trying to rate struggles. Now, obviously, we can't transport the 86 or the big three original Celtics and the bad boy Pistons and the Lakers. We can't transport them. Just, let, just like we can't time machine the Golden State Warriors or the 2.0 Boston Celtics or some of these other teams back then. We can't do that. So let's just deal with what we have. LeBron having to go through, like you said, the failures, losing the 07 final skip, Now, you do remember that he averaged like 34, 35 points a game against Orlando because that's what we're doing now. If you play great and you lose, it's not your fault because that's what you told me about Michael. He played great, so those getting swept by the big three Celtics didn't matter because he played unbelievable. He did lose, Skip. He lost the 07 finals. He lost the 2011 finals. Struggle, struggle, struggle. And I'm sure going through it, damn, what am I going to have to do to get get over the hump? Lost to the Celtics. His owner allegedly said that he quit. And then, lo and behold, 2012, the breakthrough season, he beats the big three Celtics, breaks them up, and then, get what happened? He gets an opportunity to play for the finals. He beat. Now, Skip Bayless would have you to believe, Jenny, and I don't know, Jenny, how you follow, how closely you follow this, but the 2012, if I'm not mistaken, the OKC Thunder, led by Kevin Durant, first team All-NBA, if I'm not mistaken, he was the scoring champ. Russell Westbrook, second team All-NBA. James Harden, sixth man of the year. That was also the team, (laughs) the OKC Thunder, beat the number one seed San Antonio Spurs after they were down 0-2, won four straight. The very team with Tim Duncan, Manu Ginobili, Tony Parker, and Kawhi Leonard. The next year that Skip Bader said was over the hill when LeBron beat them. Now, then they turn around, and when they beat LeBron in 2014, he was like, how can they beat a team that's over the hill? Skip, I'm confused. The man that overcome adversity after adversity, you can say, look, Skip, the way I look at it like this, struggles are struggles. Some people overcome struggle. It might be self-inflicted. As you mentioned, drugs might be self-inflicted. Some by Thomas Davis having three ACLs and still being able to get 15-year NFL career. He was overcome uh, 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 adversity, struggles. Some guy dealing with a drug and finally getting it, getting it straight. Hey, the honey badger is a prime example of someone overcoming struggles, getting kicked out of LSU. The very school that he set up in the endowment gave him a million dollars. What he went through, the ACL. 
Skip, those are struggles. You got to stop trying to equate all he said. Yes, this is great. It's great. Watch. I love watching it. But Skip, he's saying what look, what Mike was feeling at that moment, I felt in 2012 for all the years that I didn't get it. Because see, Skip, Magic doesn't know what it's like to struggle. Magic went from winning the NCAA title to winning the NBA finals and the finals MVP. There was no struggle. Bird had one year of struggles because the next year he won the, uh, uh, the championship. But it was year after year and the expectation skip. Jordan was thought of as the best player, even though he had no titles. He hadn't even gone to the finals. LeBron was thought of as the best player. He had gone to once and hadn't won any. So now he finally gets over the hump. So skip, the emotion starts to come out. So, yeah, it's like losing. Tom Brady, had he won all those, he would not know what it's like to lose. But when you lose a Super Bowl, Skip, you know what it's like. You know the anguish of losing that game, walking off the field. They're ushering you off. The confetti is raining down. Skip, it's just the emotion of having to groan through something that someone you know have gone through. That's all he's saying. Let's not overcomplicate this, Skip, because it's really not that complicated. There's what I went through. Michael went through something similar. The bad boy Pistons, the big three Celtics, he did that. But let's not pretend that he beat these teams in their prime because he did not, because he could not. So let's keep it 100, Skip Bayless. The big three Celtics, he did not touch in their prime. The Lakers, he did not touch in their prime. The bad boy Pistons, he did not touch in their prime. Okay, I, I got to go back to your first point. I was at the Masters that one windy Sunday when Greg Norman blew that lead. Nobody thought that Greg Norman was a LeBron James, that he was the chosen one. We all in the golf media had our doubts about his mental toughness to be able to hold on to a lead. Nobody had any doubts about his talent. Was he the greatest golfer in the world at the time? Was extraordinary. Well, he was he the greatest golfer in the world at the time? Be Jack Nicklaus. No, nobody thought that. Nobody. That, he had proven next to nothing, and he folded the way we've rarely seen anybody fold on one windy Sunday at Augusta. LeBron did it in three straight games, three finals games after he had made his infamous list in his hotel room in Dallas after winning game three to go up two games to one. These are the people I'm going to say I told you so to, and I was told, it was reported, that my name was at the top of the list. Okay, great. I'd be willing. You can tell me so, but you better close the deal. And instead, the chosen one became the frozen one in all three of those games. It was hard to watch. It was a wince. It was a flinch of, ooh, is that really happening to LeBron James? Just like it happened to Greg Norman, except nobody thought Greg Norman was going to be what everybody thought LeBron was becoming at that point. So whoa, I'm whoa, whoa, sorry, whoa. it's not the same. He can't relate to Michael yeah. Jordan's struggles. Epic versus epic fails. Don't Skip. insinuate First yourself all, into the Last Dance documentary when you don't belong in the same tweet with Michael Jordan. Skip Bayless, all I'm saying is, was the wind not blowing when Nick Faldo hit his tee shots and hit his irons? Was the wind only blowing when Greg Norman came up to tee, came up to hit his shots? Because I could have swore in Augusta in 96, the wind blew. Uh, it was Yeah, 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 96 Masters, when Norman blew that lead. I could have swore the wind was blowing for both guys, but Skip, here's the thing. Greg, you think, let me ask you a question. You remember, I think it was 99 when Valdivell had a three-shot lead on the eight in British at the British Open, and he hit his shot in the ravine. Do you think he can relate to what Greg Norman went through? Why can't he skip Bayless? Because, because that's my point. It's right there. And LeBron can relate to what Michael Jordan went through because big three Celtics, bad boy Pistons, year after year, he couldn't get over the hump. The, uh, the Bucks beat him in 85. He couldn't get over the hump, Skip. And now LeBron says, I couldn't get past the Celtics. I couldn't get past Orlando. I couldn't get past the Mavericks. I couldn't get past San Antonio. And finally, it's here. I'm here. I reached my destination. That's what he's talking about, Skip. Don't equate the same. 
Well, it wasn't a big three. It wasn't this. It wasn't that. Skip, all he's telling you is the emotion and overcome the triumph of finally reaching that scale. I can assure you, anybody that scaled the summit of Everest, they feel the same thing. That's the highest peak on earth. So the adulation, like, I did it. I did it. Time out. He did it. Did did. anybody ever refer to LeBron James as God disguised as LeBron James? That's what Larry Bird said of Michael Jordan. God disguised as Michael Jordan. Nobody ever said that about LeBron James. Did anybody say of LeBron, he's not human. We had to have a set of rules called the Jordan rules to stop him or the LeBron rules. Nobody ever said that about LeBron because he's not in the same universe with Michael Jordan. Struggles are different. There are struggles way down on this level, and there are struggles <laughs> at the highest level, and that's what Michael's were. Against legendary teams, he had legendary struggles. Against the Orlando Magic, the Orlando Magic? You, you shrank against them? Okay. That's whoa, just, whoa, that, that lives skip. in infamy. Skip. Oh, skip. You remember in eight, you remember in eight, hold on. Did he, what about the Bucks? Who was the Bucks? Michael Jordan lost 3 1 to the Bucks. Can you name somebody other than Sidney Moncrief on that team? You keep talking about he lost to the Magic. Dwight Howard was the preeminent big man in all of basketball. So what? Huh? And then who else? A bunch of three point shooters? Really? Oh, come on. Oh, so who was on that Milwaukee by, by team? The way, who was on Michael that Milwaukee lost, team? Yeah. Okay, well, wait a second. Michael Jordan's a baby, and LeBron in his first two years in the league didn't make the playoffs. Now he a baby. At least Jordan made the playoffs, right? The the man was a hold on. I know. Last I checked, when my guy was a teenager, he was paying bills. He was paying mama bills. He was paying mama for a a house note. He was buying paying for his own car, car insurance. When your guy was a teenager, mama was sending him stamps. That's a big difference because when LeBron was a teenager, he was the daddy. He was taking care of everybody. Don't do that, Skip. You know it's not comparable. No, you don't. You do know it, that, LeBron. <laughs> you guys can go on and on all day about this one. I'm stopping it for now. No mercy. So we may be seeing a lot of Jalen Hurts in 2020, even with a healthy Carson Wentz. According to an NFL Network report, Hurts will be on the field for the Eagles this upcoming season and might even do so in a straight running back role. So, Shannon, do you have a problem with this? Yes, I do, Skip. I I really don't understand what they're thinking. I don't like the pick for them. I'm not saying Jalen Hurts shouldn't have been a second-round pick because I believe he played well enough and he's shown the ability to throw the football, Skip, that he can help a team and eventually he can be a starting quarterback in this league. But Skip, Jalen Hurts is a good running quarterback. He's not a running back. He's not Taysom Hill. And everybody's like, you can use it. Skip, Taysom Hill, not only does he throw the ball, he run patterns. They throw him screens. They throw him the ball down the field. That's not what Jalen Hurts is. Skip, you you take a quarterback. You didn't do that with Pat, Pat, uh, uh, Pat, uh, uh, Pat Mahomes. You don't do that with these other quarterbacks. That's not what he is. You're trying to make him out of a gadget. You're trying to make him something that he's not. Skip, he's not a running back. He's a quarterback. Skip, if you want to bring him on the field and you want to go wildcat in third and short, if you want to go wildcat fourth and short, if you want to go a change of pace or something like that, but to think that this guy's a running back, you're just going to hand him the ball? That makes no sense, which tells me, look, I, I know that they said we called Carson and we told him we we're going to be got it. This is, the more, the more I hear them explain what they're going to do with him, the more ridiculous this pick sounds for them. I don't get what they're going to do, try to do with him. But if you got him to play quarterback, develop him, develop him as a quarterback without using all these gadgets. On this one, I am so with you. You know I don't like the Eagles to start with. And now I like them even less because it's degrading and it's insulting to try to use Jalen Hurts in this role. It reminds me of the teams who told Lamar Jackson at the Combine, yeah, we'd consider you Mm -hmm. if you'd want to play receiver. No, he said, I'm a quarterback. And all he did last year was win the MVP of this league as a quarterback. 
Jalen yes. Hurts is a quarterback, not a running back, not a receiver, not Thank anything you. but a leader of the football team. So Jalen Hurts does not have the quickness or the speed of Lamar Jackson, not the foot quickness or no. the straight line no. speed. He ran 4-5, mm -hmm. which actually surprised me. I was sort of pleasantly surprised he could run 4-5. But he goes about 220. He is a weight room warrior. He, he was always pound for pound the strongest man in his college weight room at Alabama and Oklahoma. And he will make you miss or he will run through you on key downs. But that's off read options. That's off rollouts. Right. That's off extemporaneous plays in which he is the quarterback with the ball in his hands to start the play. A lot of it's off script. But once yeah. he gets on a roll, he's hard to stop because he is a momentum playmaker who, if he makes one six-yard gain for a first down on third and five, then the next couple of plays, he'll make another play. And then he'll make another play. He'll make another play. If you start trying to use him as some gadget guy, put him in on third and one at tailback just to hand him the ball and say, get us a yard, he will lose his momentum. He might lose a, a little bit of his way where, where he's like, who am I? I, I want to be the leader of this team. The gadget guy can't be the leader of the team. He's not Taysom Hill. He's Jalen Hurts. No. And they think they're going to reinvent a Taysom Hill in their offense because Doug Peterson has a huge ego. He wrote a book off his Super Bowl <laughs> victory, the Philly special, called, what was it? Fearless. I'm fearless. Well, the next year he didn't look so fearless to me. But the point is, he's, tr he's got a big ego to the point that he's going to say, watch what we can do with Jalen Hurts. That's not fair to Jalen Hurts, and it's not fair, no. as you pointed out, to Carson Wentz. And they said, Doug Peterson said, well, we called Carson right before we made the pick, and we said, and I'm going to paraphrase this, you're the face of the franchise. You're our starting quarterback, but we value quarterbacks, plural. We want to have several quarterbacks on the roster that we can either develop or utilize in other ways. Not fair to Carson, not fair to Jalen, and it's all about your ego and not their growth. You're going to stunt the growth of both quarterbacks if you try to mix and match them. So, again, mm -hmm. Shannon, to me, this is so insulting to Jalen Hurts because they're basically telling him, we don't really think you're a starting quarterback. We think we can utilize you in little ways to capitalize on the fact that you scored 20 rushing titles at Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Stop it. You know, I told you going in, Jalen Hurts, I told you before the draft, is a starting quarterback in this league, and he's good enough on leadership and willpower and playmaking to lead a team to the playoffs. That's good enough for me, but he's not going to get that opportunity in the situation into which he was forced via the draft pick. Skip, you're absolutely right. When I look at Taysom Hill, Skip, he had six pass attempts, 27 rush attempts, and caught 19 passes. Skip, if you look at the way the Ravens developed Lamar Jackson, they had packages that they would bring him in in the series, and he would run those packages. Skip, he wasn't a running back. They didn't line him up at wide receiver and try to throw him the ball or try to run screens with him. They developed him as a quarterback. That's what you should do with Jalen Hurts. You took him as a quarterback, develop him as a quarterback. Skip, defenses hit differently on a running back than they do a quarterback because the quarterback still has the potential to run the football. When they hand the ball to a running back, this is why sometimes running back can throw touchdown passes off the run because they're not expecting it. That's why Walter Payton was so good at it, Skip. When they hand the ball to Walter Payton, you're thinking he's going to run. Well, he touched the ball, and all of a sudden he pulls up and he throws a touchdown. Well, when I hand, you hand that ball up to Jalen Hurts, they're not thinking anything. They're going to tee off, and they're looking to, 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 to do some damage. And you're putting him in a situation. Yep. Develop him as a quarterback. And if I'm Carson Wentz, Skip, and a lot of times I equate things to relationships because I think everybody at some point in time has been involved in a relationship. And I look at the quarterback, especially one like Carson Wentz, 
to an organization or to Doug Peterson as a marriage. Okay, you like, you know what we did? You look at what we've done. We had this two this quarter of a million dollar wedding. I got you a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar ring, but you know I'll be looking at women because you know I like women, and so I'm all you know I'm all about you know you know maybe I find a woman down the road. Who do you think is gonna be accepting of that, Skip? Because that's basically what they told Carson Wentz. Yes, we gave up a lot to get you. Yes, we gave you the big deal. But you know we still looking at quarterback now. Hey, I got my eye on one, huh? And I know Carson's like, hey guys, you got to do what you got to do. But come on, Skip. At some point in time, <laughs> look, you done ordered. Turn the menu back to the way to go on. You know those saying, Skip, hey, just because I'm an order don't mean I can't read the menu. At some point in time, the dinner's done come, Jenny. You can't keep reading the menu. Once the dinner's served, get the menu back. Now, you might want to look at the drink menu one last time, but don't be looking at the entree and appetizer menu. And that's what the Eagles are doing. Carson Wentz, you need to go up there and call the ruckus. Hey, I would go up there and say, I understand we're under quarantine, but hey, Dougie P, hi, Roseman. I need to see y'all ASAP. I am so with you on that, but I'm, I'm going to conclude with one point that I stand by. I believe if, if they actually gave Jalen Hurts a shot to win the starting job, I believe in him so much, I believe he would be more successful long-term than Carson Wentz will be as the Eagles quarterback. I'm going so far as to say that's how good he will be in this league if he gets the chance. But... Carson Wentz has already proclaimed the face of the franchise and the starting quarterback, and they gave him his money. They're committed to him cap-wise, so it's not realistic for me to say, go beat him out, because I don't think they're going to allow him the opportunity to beat out Carson Wentz, and I don't think they should give him the opportunity to do that. So my point is, again, they're going to question Carson Wentz's durability, so maybe by default, by, by injury, Jalen gets the shot. And then I think he would seize that opportunity. But I don't even want to talk about it because I always tell you, Shannon, I do not wish injury upon anybody. If I got some wood to knock on, I'm going to knock on this wood for Carson Wentz's sake. I know he's been hurt. I know he had the concussion shortly into the playoff game, which was his first one against Seattle. But still... He was healthy for 16 games last year, and I'm not going to make that part of this equation going forward. Skip, I, 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 don't, I don't believe that Jalen Hurts could beat out Carson Wentz for the job, but if you want to put the job up, it's hard for me to believe, Skip, that a gadget guy, and that's what seems to me that what they're going to use Jalen Hurts as in his rookie year, as a gadget guy, can be the guy that's a, 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 a you know, he, he's getting better, but a guy that's gone to Pro Bowls and that was the front runner for the MVP until he got hurt, develop him as a quarterback. Don't use him as gadget. Develop him as a quarterback. If that's what you want to do, develop him like they did Baltimore because you believe, Skip, that he has the potential to be something like uh, Lamar Jackson. Skip, look how they developed Lamar Jackson. They put a package in and a series or two, he would run that every game. But they weren't throwing him the ball. They wouldn't run it here. Get a line up in the eye. We're going to hand you the football. That's not what they did. They developed him as a quarterback, and he progressed, and he became unanimous MVP. No mercy. The Cowboys don't seem too concerned that they don't have Dak locked up to a long-term deal, despite reports that he will not be participating in off-season activities. When asked about the negotiation process, Jerry Jones said, quote, when we're ready to play, he'll be there. So, Shannon, what does this quote tell you about where these negotiations are heading? They're in the exact same place. Um, and I told Skip they were, they were heading this franchise tag, and Jerry seems to be emboldened now. Everybody's patting him on the back and telling what a great draft he had. And Jerry, you should do all the drafts from your yacht. You did, hit, did, hit, uh, had such a slam dunk. You had a grand slam, knocked it out of the park with these draft picks. So he's feeling emboldened. And he's, yeah, when it comes time to play, he'll be there. This is what we have on the table. He can take it or leave it. And he started it. He and Steven started sowing these seeds a couple of, a couple of uh, 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 what do they call it, Skip? Uh, combines ago. You know, Dak needs to give us a break and he needs to work with us. You know, yada, yada, yada. So important. Is trying to paint. If Dak doesn't sign the deal that we're offering, he's selfish. He's not about winning championships. And Dak says, look, I play, I'm giving you a discount. The first three years of this contract, the first four years of this contract was the discount. 
Now I'm here to come to that balloon payment. It's come due. Now I'm going to get my money. And if I have to hold out to get it, now I don't, uh, Skip, I don't anticipate him missing games, but he might. Um, and it's, it's, a, a lot of things happen when you go through tragedy. Now, I don't know the last conversation he and his brother had, but I know his brothers are very, very close to him, and they do almost everything together, and they're a big part of him. Now, his brother might have said, Dak, you need to stick in, you, need, you know, hey, stick to your guns. And I believe if he said that, Dak going to stick to his gun, and that means missing a few games, he'll miss a few games. But, Jerry, you need to do right, because the thing that's Dak not going to do is what Scottie Pippen did. Scottie Pippen signed a contract, and after two years, it was obsolete, and they wouldn't negotiate, renegotiate. Dak is not going to get caught in that same situation. He's going to do a deal that three or four years out, this deal, this deal is still a damn good deal. And so Dak, Skip, is coming to a crescendo. It's, it, you know what's happening, Skip. You see it. You know what's going to happen. You know it. You don't want to. You might not admit it, but you know what's happening is coming down the pipeline. Okay, first point of order, Jerry Reinsdorf, the owner of the Bulls, tried to talk Scotty out of signing that contract. He just flat out said, this is a bad deal for you. Don't sign it. Scotty said, no, I need the upfront security. And he signed it. Well, now the joke's on him. The onus is on him to live up to the rest of the contract. And he did not want to live up to it. It did get rendered obsolete almost overnight. I got you. This is very different than that. And God bless Dak going through his grieving of his older brother, Jace. I got you on that. I have no idea what Jace told him. I don't know how that's going to play going forward. I only know that this negotiation had already stalled before Jace passed. And it sounds like it's going nowhere slowly as we speak. And Jerry's comment to me was ominous because he basically said, when it's time to play the first game, he'll be there. That's all you got? He'll be there for the first regular season <laughs> real game, the first game that counts? That's where we are? And obviously, Shannon, you would like to see this get uglier and uglier because you do not like the Dallas Cowboys. I respect that. I, like I get that but I have to navigate that here on the show. You are rooting openly for Dak to hold out and screw it up, screw up next year's team, make it virtually impossible for next year's team to be as good as it can be. Yes, there's a lot of new momentum off that draft and Jerry did knock it out of the park. And when CeeDee Lamb fell into their laps, they had him sixth on the board and he fell to 17. I was ecstatic because life changed because I told you I'm not great with giving Amari Cooper a hundred million dollars off his performance on the road last year. He did tap out at the Jets and at the Patriots. He just he quit. He pouted. I, I can't get open on Stefan Gilmore. Stop it. Then you're not worth a hundred million dollars. It got so bad against the Eagles. Jason Garrett yanked him. He thought he was running his routes half-heartedly. He finally said, we can do better. I'll put Tavon in. Tavon Austin down the stretch was in in place of Amari Cooper. And once again, we had to see him standing on the sidelines, wide-eyed, blinking, like, what just happened? Now you've got a new candidate to be your number one receiver in CeeDee Lamb. He's a stud. He's an alpha. He's a one. He might emerge as the one ahead of Amari, but he's going to lift Amari's game, especially on the road. Amari's going to be saying, wait a second, he's rising and shining. He's the first round pick. I better try to live up to that. So I love CeeDee's presence, what he's going to bring, his value to the receiver room. He's going to up the energy and, and the, the electricity in that room. He is a playmaking, big game, big play receiver. He goes up and catches the football wherever it is. So Dak, new momentum. You have a new toy. You have a new weapon. Aaron Rodgers doesn't have that weapon. You do. And you still have Zeke and you still have Gallup, obviously, I didn't mention. And you still have a top five offensive line. 
So it's time for you as the leader of this team in the face of this franchise to compromise a little bit. I still believe that you and your agent, Dak, went out of bounds with your demands. I, I believe it became unrealistic. I believe that, as I've said before, I had a source tell me your agent is, quote unquote, overplaying his hand. So you need to rein it back in a little bit, rein Dakota Prescott. You, you need to say, OK, let's compromise this much because I do have 12 national TV commercials because I'm the quarterback of America's team. There's a time when you have to come to grips with don't sacrifice the team for your greed, because I think it's become greed. Yeah. Because I think you're, at, you're asking for beyond Mahomes money. There's a time when you yeah. say, I can't sacrifice winning for negotiating. There's a time you're to free? say, let's move a little closer to the middle because it's still great <laughs> money and we'll be okay because I still get my TV commercials and I still have a lot to prove in this league. He's one and two in the playoffs is Dak Prescott. He didn't make some key plays last year for the first time in his career, and they went eight and eight. I don't know that he has the bargaining power that Patrick Mahomes has right now. Mahomes was great not. again last year, and they won the Super Bowl. Okay, so I'm sorry he can make very good money, but I don't think he deserves great money yet in his career. I do, I do. but here's the thing, though, Skip. Now, you said Jerry Reinsdorf told Scottie Pippen not to sign the contract, and he did. Now you're saying Jerry Jones is telling Dak to do this contract, and he should. Oh, so now I'm trying to figure out why is it only the player that sacrifices winning? What about the team? They're sacrificing winning because they're putting their bottom line in front of winning. Dak Prescott says, I've done what you've asked me to do. I've exceeded whatever your expectations were, were of me. I've exceeded them. Now you want me to compromise. And if I don't compromise, I'm being selfish. Well, Jerry, you're being selfish because you're putting your bottom line wanting to win in front of bottom line of wanting to win this deal against me in front of the team. Give me my money because, like you said, there's a new influx. There's a new game coming. There's a new there's a new uh, 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 TV money coming. And Dak Prescott says, I'm not going to get caught like Scottie Pippen. That was a good deal at the time. But Jerry Reinsdorf knew the new TV money was coming, just like Jerry does. Todd France and Dak also knows it. So I'm not signing a bad deal. I'm going to get $80 million fully guaranteed with about $160 over the next year. Yeah, $160 million, and deal. I want 80 of it fully guaranteed. Guaranteed. Yes. Y you, you are daring to compare what Jerry has offered Dak to what Jerry Reinsdorf told Scotty not to sign, you're, you're, it's, it's, absurd. it's ludicrous. It's asinine, yeah. 10, 11, 12, and 13. Here, it's Skip, impossibly wrong to compare those two situations. Skip, here's the thing. Scotty's like, I got to sign this contract because that's guaranteed money. No matter what transpired, I'm going to get all that money. Are you telling me when is the NFL contract? The only fully guaranteed contract I've ever heard of was Kirk Cousins. He got three years, 84 million, fully guaranteed. That is the only contract. So until I hear, I'm not skip. I don't care nothing about no 35 million a year. I don't care about 150. I don't care about 200. Until we know what the fully guaranteed numbers are, clearly. They're not to Dak and his agent's liking. Until they get to that liking, if I'm Dak, I'm like this. I'm like a kid. I'm a spoiled brat. I'm my arm folded, my mouth stuck out, and I ain't signing the deal. Now what? Spoken like a true cowboy hater. Now back to what's <laughs> on the table. You have no idea what's on the table, and nobody has any idea just how much Dak and new agent are demanding. I think it's beyond 40 million. I think they want it all guaranteed. And I believe the deal on the table from Jerry would immediately make Dak the number one paid quarterback in the league only until Mahomes signs and then he'll be the number two paid quarterback. That's a fair deal. He should compromise to the point of, okay, I'll still take 
second best money to Patrick Mahomes. And trust me, most of it is going to be guaranteed. You know it, and I know it. No mercy. In A plus for their draft from Pro Football Focus, for the offensive line help, they got Baker Mayfield along with several picks on the defensive side. The Ravens have won the AFC North the past two seasons and received the highest grade from Mel Kuyper for their draft. So, Shannon, what shot do you give the Browns of dethroning the Ravens? Not much, but everything is predicated on if their quarterback has matured, if he's going to do a better job of protecting the football. Skip, I love the draft picks they got. They got a, uh, they got an offensive lineman in the first round to pair with Jack with Conklin, who they got in free agency. They made some solid moves, but everything is predicated on Baker Mayfield. And since I, I, I have yet to see it, I want to see it with my own eyes, and then I'll say, okay, they've arrived. I'm taking the Ravens. Skip, you know, they add Calais Campbell in the offseason. You look at the draft. They get Patrick Queen from LSU, a sudden impactful linebacker. They signed J.K. Dobbins, another running back, ran for two bands at the the Ohio State. They pick up a slot receiver in Devin DuVernay. I wonder if he's any kin to Ava DuVernay, you know, the American filmmaker. I don't know, Skip, but this kid can fly. This kid can run. He caught over 100 passes at the University of Texas last year. And so I love what they're doing. They're giving... Skip, if you notice what they did now, they increased the defensive line because they said what happened last year is not going to happen again. There's not going to be another situation where a team runs the ball down our throat and we can't get the ball back for our, uh, 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 for our quarterback and our offense. And then for the offensive side, they're like, we're going to get more explosive at the running back position and we're going to get more explosive at the wide receiver position. So I love what the Ravens are doing. And John Harbaugh, they're lockstep and barrel. I, I love what they're doing. There's no, there no uncertainty. You have a picking order. Everybody understands it. They have a Ravens way, the way they do things. I'm taking the Ravens in that division. Now, Skip, you know, Big Ben comes back next year. We'll see how he plays coming off the elbow surgery. But Ben has a lot of miles on that body. Ben is taking some punishment. Cincinnati, we know they're a work in progress. But I'm taking the Ravens in this division. Quick point on Devin DuVernay, you won't remember this, but I kept telling you I want him on my pro football team because he haunted my Oklahoma Sooners every time they played him. (laughs) You can't cover him in the slot. He didn't look like he ran that fast to me. And then he goes to the combine and times four, three something. And I'm like, game over. And then the Ravens get him. Not fair, because trust me, he will become a new security blanket on third and four for Lamar Jackson. So I give you that they look invincible, but I definitely give this upgraded Browns roster a shot. And it's exactly what you just said. It comes down to Baker Mayfield. Can you take a step that you took backward last year? Can you take it forward once you got two new tackles, as you point out, Two, you you got two stud tackles. Your protection Mm -hmm. has to be a little better than it was last year. And you got Austin Hooper at tight end. And uh, obviously, Njoku is going to be back. He broke his wrist last year. And then that Harrison Bryant that they drafted, he was just the most productive tight end in America last year at Florida Atlantic. And I like him. When I just watch his tape, I say he can play. I think he'll contribute a little bit. So the problem is they just fired the man who picked Baker Mayfield. They just fired the coach who believed in Baker and who coached him and defended him last year. And all of a sudden, Mm -hmm. Andrew Barry takes over as the youngest GM in all of pro football at age 32 last January. And I got to give him an A-plus for everything he's done so far. It's spectacular. Mm -hmm. He has put Baker in a position to succeed next year that I think he really wasn't in last year when the expectations ran wild and then ran over Baker Mayfield. Again, he did way too many progressive insurance commercials. I think it worked. I know he made a ton of money, but every other commercial on TV was Baker in his house (laughs) in the Brown Stadium for progressive. It's too many. It's too much. It painted too big a target on Baker's back. We need to cut back on the commercials and we need to up the ante on the commitment to becoming the quarterback I believe Baker can become. Now, again, the problem is 
what a lot of people think is the strength. I thought they were going to trade Odell, and they did not before the draft. Maybe they still will, but I doubt it. So last year, to a fault, Baker tried to make Odell happy and then keep him happy while juggling footballs between Odell and his best friend, Jarvis Landry. It's hard to do. And again, Odell looked like he was in decline last year because I don't think his heart was in playing in Cleveland for the Browns. He's a big Apple guy. He's an L.A. guy. And he's stuck out in the hinterland playing in Cleveland. He never seemed to warm up to it. All of his numbers were career lows. So can can Baker figure out how to put him sort of back in the right place in the offense and spread the ball and start throwing it to Austin Hooper and Njoku and, and make this offense go as a multiple offense instead of a force the ball to Odell offense. That's what has to happen. Baker is gifted enough to do that. I still believe in him. And when you add Jonathan, uh, I mean, uh, what's it, Carl Joseph and Grant Delpit at safety. I'm not the biggest Grant Delpit guy, but they got him later in the draft and second yeah. round. I'm okay I, with I'm that. He, they'll upgrade the safeties. So, so again, you know, if you get Miles Garrett back and, and you still have Olivier Vernon and, and uh, Ogan Joby, they, they got firepower on defense. This is a good football team. If Baker can play the way he did in several games when he was a rookie and the way he always plays against Baltimore because he lights up Baltimore. He lit him up last year. Mm-hmm. I think they're good enough yep. to challenge the Ravens this year. Skip, for me, you said uh, what Baker struggled with, he was trying to get the ball to Odell. Oh, he's also going to need to stop trying to get the last word because anytime somebody criticizes him from this side of the table, he always wants to take a parting yep. shot back. And you True. know you know what you signed up for, Baker. Everybody is not on your fan club. Our job is to critique your play. And your play was not very good, so it's our job to point that out. You don't have to get the last word. You can get the last word, go play well. That'll shut it all down. All that, all that talking, yeah. you got something snide to say about every time someone says something about you that's negative. If you go play well, that's the best last word you can give. You don't always have to verbally respond. Just respond with your play. I'm not saying just let people run over you. But you don't have to respond to every single thing, Skip. Yeah. Yeah. Last quick point. (laughs) Kevin Stefanski, the new Browns coach, worked minor miracles with Kirk Cousins in Minnesota. Maybe he can do the same for Baker in Cleveland. (laughs) Maybe. Maybe. Last time the Browns won the division, 1989, and I was two years old. So it's been a bit. No mercy. So Aaron Gordon released a diss track calling out Dwayne Wade's dunk contest vote that made Gordon lose out to Miami's Derrick Jones Jr. And yesterday morning, Dwayne Wade tweeted that Gordon should trademark the title track 9 out of 10 to make some money off of it, adding, that is free advice. So Shannon, was this a good idea or a bad idea by Gordon? (laughs) Hey, Baskin, look. He rapped, he says, 9 out of 10, you play and pretend. 9 out of 10, man, here we go again. Skip, he's disappointed. Skip, he's in what, three contests. It's hard for me to see a scenario watching these, this guy dunk that he comes away empty-handed in three of those contests. Skip, I just don't see how. Um, I'm not saying that he should have gotten, but there are some dunks that he should have put that, should have. he shouldn't even got to this point. I thought he beat uh, Jones Jr. Now, some people say, but Skip, with the dunks that he's done, that we've never seen. And for him to, look, Skip, Taco is 7'6". And people say, well, he didn't dunk. But think about this. His head is 7'6". Think about what Taco has the ball. He got to win this one. But, you know, he had a a, a glass of wine last night, so Dwayne Wade took it in good light. Okay. But he's disappointed and rightfully so. (laughs) Okay. My question is, who is Aaron Gordon to diss track the great Dwayne Wade? Aaron Gordon does not belong in the same sentence with a Dwayne Wade who was known for winning championships and teaching LeBron how to win championships. He wasn't known for dunk contests. So in the end, if, if Aaron Gordon's diss track had been clever or funny, I, I might give him a pass on this one. But it wasn't clever, it wasn't funny, and he's getting no pass from me. Respect your elders and respect true greatness, Aaron Gordon.
Hey, D-Way, nine out of ten, you cost the fam a bend. Nine out of ten, man, you probably cost me an M. That's what he did. Respect man, he cost that man some bread. Elders. <laughs> that is how we're going to leave the show today. That's it for Undisputed. We'll be back same time tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Eastern. The Herd is coming up right after us. Have a good day, guys. <laughs>